hello. On today's um, Living With episode, I'd love to introduce you to Dr. Tom Scammell, who is the Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and Boston Children's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. But for the last 25 years, Dr. Scammell has run a research lab at Beth Israel Deaconess and focused on identifying the neural mechanisms that control sleep and wakefulness. He has received several NIH grants to study the control of sleep and wakefulness by the hypothalamus and brainstem. And much of his lab's work now focuses on narcolepsy and identifying the pathways through which the orexin neuropeptides stabilize wakefulness and suppress cataplexy. This is really significant um, for our IH community also. And today, Dr. Scammell and I talk about current medications, current research that he's focusing on that's going on in the sleep space and how that impacts upcoming medications and opportunities for our community. So join me in welcoming Dr. Scammell. Dr. Scammell, it's always a pleasure to have some time with you. And before we jump into um, sort of a deep dive around treatment for people with idiopathic hypersomnia, I wondered whether you could just share with us what you do and why you chose to be a sleep specialist. Oh yeah, so um, so I'm a neurologist. So I trained in neurology and um, I've always been interested in kind of the basic things that the brain controls, whether it's appetite or body temperature or sleep. And um, and I did some, I, after I finished my neurology training, I was doing some basic research on how the brain controls body temperature, but it was kind of clear that this didn't have a whole lot of clinical impact. And and then when I started talking to people about sleep disorders, I realized I could probably have a bigger impact by working on sleep disorders. And so I trained up in sleep medicine and I've been doing that now for the last 25 years or so. Um, and and so as a clinician who does basic science, I feel like this sort of, a, it's a nice opportunity for me to take the things that I hear in clinic, the questions and concerns that patients have, and then really say, well, what, what, what can we figure out in animal models and so forth to really get a good sense of a deeper understanding of this problem? Yeah, I was going to ask you actually, because you obviously, you're a clinician and a leading researcher. How how does that work sort of Monday through Friday? What, what does yeah. a typical week look like for you? <laughs> yeah, so I spend about a day a week taking care of patients and then the rest of the time focused on the research. Um, Honestly, there's, we have lots of patients. It would be nice if I could spend more time in clinic, but you gotta you gotta put your energy into something. And research is pretty competitive, so I yeah. I try to keep my focus on that. Okay. So currently, where is your research focused? Oh, all over the place. <laughs> lots of questions on narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia. I do a little bit of clinical research, and so we're doing a project on how idiopathic hypersomnia impacts the lives of young adults. Um, the social lives and the romantic lives of young adults with idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, we're interested in doing more projects, sort of a deeper dive into the, what's really going on biologically in these folks who can sleep for such extraordinarily long periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the basic side, um, we're, we're looking at mechanisms of cataplexy and sleepiness and, and, and also a project related to um, how some of the new drugs work, um, mm -hmm. uh, specifically, you know, what are they doing in the brain to help wake people up? Mm -hmm. So with your patients that have IH, what what do you feel are some of the, like from a clinical point of view, some of the, the biggest challenges you have as a doctor? Yeah. So, um, well, I think huh, starting challenge is actually making the diagnosis because we don't have a good marker for this. We don't have a good positive test where we can say you definitely have IH. It's really based a lot upon the, the person's history and um and you know the name idiopathic literally means we don't know what causes it, and so and so we really um, have to sort of make sure that we're not missing something else, that they don't have some sleep apnea, that it's not narcolepsy, that they don't have sedating medications on board, and so forth. Um, and sometimes we can be very confident about the diagnosis. Sometimes it's just like hmm, maybe, but it's really hard to be absolutely certain. Are you sure there isn't something that we're missing? And so and so I. I often put a question mark next to it in the charts because, um, you know, I think it's always good to keep an open mind because maybe there's something that we're missing there. Is that is that quite hard for the patient though? Well, yeah, I mean, people like to have out. people like to have have you know some be firmly anchored, but um, and you know, obviously, you know, we have a work, you know, we say, well, the you know, the working diagnosis is idiopathic hypersound, You're going to treat you for that, but you know, we may keep looking. As, as time goes on for other things too. And as research progresses, maybe we'll get new ideas. 
Yeah. So um, where do you feel the tension is then from the sort of clinical point of view between a patient comes in and you've got this working diagnosis of IH, but maybe it's type two narcolepsy? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's some tension on the diagnostic side and that maybe we want to go back and repeat their sleep studies. Maybe if they're maybe if it's somebody who's got some depression or something, we really want to try to do clean sleep studies off of medications. That question comes up a lot. Um, but ultimately on the treatment side, you know, we just got to make people better as, as best we can. And so, you know, we'll give them, a, you know, behavioral advice, we'll give them recommendations for medications. And then obviously there's some tension sometimes in actually getting the meds paid for, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I've talked to, you know, when patients have had trouble getting their meds through an insurance company, I've called the docs at the insurance company to get permission. And they say, well, we don't have any medicines recommended for IH. And I'm like, yeah, it's a rare disease. And, and, and some, sometimes it takes some education and arm twisting to get those things done. Yeah. So what would be, um, maybe let's start with like, you, you mentioned the non-medical approach to treating IH. Is there anything more you want to say about that before we get into some therapeutic options? Yeah. So I do think that, you know, we, we make the most progress when we, when we use medications in IH, but I do think it's important to keep a number of things in mind. Um, and it's really individual, you know, it really depends on the person because, you know, there's some people with IH who sleep for long times, so there's others who don't. And, and one thing that's sometimes a remarkably hard question to answer is what's your optimal amount of sleep? You know, somebody might um, say, well, I can sleep 12 hours, but I don't really feel better with 12 than with eight. And so sometimes it's just a matter of sort of finding, whatever, you know, something that's practical, because the truth is if you're sleeping 12 hours a day, there's a lot of hours that you're not getting stuff done. Um, and so, um, if somebody really doesn't feel any different with eight hours, you know, we'll try to recommend a schedule around eight hours of sleep, but certainly not less than that. Um, because we want to make sure that insufficient sleep isn't contributing in some fashion. Um, would you say, would you say the same sort of approach applies to daytime naps in people with IH then? For yeah. To find their, like, is their sweet spot almost? So, you know, in narcolepsy, really most people with narcolepsy like their naps and they benefit from the naps. They'll take a 15 or 20 minute nap and they feel better afterwards. And so naps are, are super in narcolepsy because it's a way of actually helping trim down the meds so we don't have to push the meds so hard. In IH, it's kind of a different story. Some people, like actually I'd probably say the minority, take naps and find them refreshing. But a lot of people with IH can end up sleeping for a long time, two or three hours, and then they just feel junky afterwards, really foggy and so forth. And so in the end, is it really worth it? Occasionally, sometimes not. And so in narcolepsy, I, I really encourage naps in IH, not so much. Yeah, but again, you know, it depends on the person. Though. And I think it's, you got to know yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting distinction. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So a patient has IH. Um, what medications would you kind of start with, recommend, think think through and talk through with the, with the patient? Sure. Just before we leave the non-med stuff, because I do think it's important, we want to tune things up as best possible without medicines first. But I guess I would just, you know, also ask people, you know, what are the things that tend to make them more alert? What makes them more sleepy? And under, again, understand yourself. Um, you know, if heavy meals are a problem, you know, think about what you're, what you're eating. If you're in a really sedentary work environment, you know, get up, walk around, turn on bright lights, talk to people, you know, do do things that are a little bit more engaging. So sorry, I just wanted to I just wanted no. to bring this up too because I think it's I think you know if you can get as much mileage as possible without the meds, that's great, all the better. Right. Do you ever touch on um, you know kind of using light in the circadian rhythm as well in people with IH? Because yeah. I know that for. Yeah, yeah. Light is it. Light itself is alerting, and so having nice, bright, full spectrum phototherapy lights literally makes anybody more awake. Um, and there's an idea that's not that I would say that people are still researching that possibly one of the things that makes it hard for people with IH to wake up in the morning is that it's kind of like their their nighttime sleep period just doesn't end. And so by by using bright light in the morning, um, you may actually be able to trim down that we call it the biological night and help them rouse a little more easily in the morning. Mm -hmm. Which is so hard to do in the winter, isn't it? Depending on when you live, obviously, but well, you know, that's, seasonal. Yeah. That's yeah. why, that's why phototherapy lights can, can fill in that gap for people yeah. who live in more northerly areas. Yeah. If you're lucky enough to live somewhere where there's great sun in those winter, 
great just get in a sunny window or go outside or something but if not the phototherapy yeah. lights are a nice idea yeah that's good that's good advice all right so medications for people with IH we know it's challenging we know there's real limitations there um where is your focus for yeah. patients so we use the same meds to help improve sleepiness that we use in narcolepsy. And I'm going to just share my screen for a second here. Um, so does that look okay? Perfect. Got it? Thank you. Yeah. So, so this is a list of pretty much the typical meds we use for promoting sleepiness. Um, and I should point out the only one of these that is FDA approved for idiopathic hypersomnia is Zywave down at the bottom. And we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but, um, I would say it's much more common to at least try the other medicines first, um, and sometimes those work okay. Um, but there's a, I, I, I'll, I'll comment on it as we get to the oxidates at the bottom of why I don't necessarily use those right out of the gate. Um, so since the 1940s, docs have used various kinds of stimulants to help improve alertness. Um, and so I've listed a few of them there. And sometimes these work fine. And the nice thing is, is they're inexpensive. They're um, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of um, options in terms of how we actually dose them. Um, and a couple of things I just want to sort of point out as, as sort of worthy of comment here. Um, one is um, that, you know, actually, you know, I'll, I'll save it. I'll save it for later when we're talking about morning sleepiness, because here, this, this slide is really focused on maintaining alertness across the day. We'll talk about waking up in the morning in a sec. But anyway, the stimulants are nice because you can kind of you can kind of use short acting or long acting. Um, they do have side effects, which I've listed on the on the column there. Um, and uh, as a general rule, I would say that we can get usually okay improvements in alertness when we use the stimulants in folks with IH. Um, modafinil and armodafinil are kind of interchangeable. Um, and those drugs increase dopamine in the brain. And the nice thing with those is that they're actually pretty well tolerated. Most people do pretty fine with them. Um, very, you know, 15% of people get a headache, 5% get um, nausea, but really um, so there's some of the gentlest that we have. And if you can get traction with that, that's terrific. Um, also nice long duration of action. So sometimes just morning dosing or twice a day is good enough. Um, so reamphetol is a pretty potent medicine. Um, we don't have a lot of experience with it in IH. And so I, I can't say too much, but I would say that it works pretty well in narcolepsy. And I have a few IH patients on it who seem to be doing okay. okay. Pitolasant um, is a, is a, a, has an unusual mechanism of action. And so it's in a category of its own. Um, again, very nicely tolerated medicine, kind of expensive um, and sort of on the gentler side, like modafinil. Um, so people tolerate it well, but it's, um, I, it, and it's something we really need to learn more about is, is it gonna really work well for folks with IH? It's actually, there's some there's a clinical trial underway right now. And then the oxabates, as I mentioned before, are this class of medicine. The, the, the oxabates are also known as gamma hydroxybutyrate or GHB. And there's now three of them, Zyrem, Zywave, and Lumrise. And Zywave, which is a low sodium version, um, has been approved for idiopathic hypersomnia. This is an unusual medicine in that the other ones that I listed, you take during the day to help wake you up. Oxabates, you take at night and it produces very deep sleep. And by some process we don't understand, people feel more awake the next day. Um, kind of the side effect profile is not as great as the other meds. And so it's not unusual for people to have some problems. Most of the time they just sleep through these things. But if you wake up an hour after taking a dose of one of these things, people feel pretty, they can feel nauseous and sort of un drunk and unsteady. And um, But uh, yeah, so, so Zyrem is the original one, high so lot, really has a lot of sodium, Zywave, low sodium. Lumrise is a new one that just came out this, this summer, and it's, um, it's a once nightly as opposed to twice nightly for the other two. Um, and so uh, I, I would say that in people with idiopathic hypersomnia, we actually see some of the best improvements in daytime alertness with the oxabates. Um, mm -hmm. I hesitate to use them initially because the side effects can be more bothersome and the cost is very high. Um, yeah. But but if the other if you can't if you can't get good results with the um, other meds, then I think it's a really good strong option. So Zywave is available for people with IH. Um, is there hope for people with IH to eventually get Lumirise? 
I, I, I would think so. I mean, I would, from a clinical perspective, I'd have to say if the insurance pays for it, I see no reason why they shouldn't take Lumrise. I think I, I would consider all of these good, strong options. And in fact, we've used Xyrem for years before it was ever, you know, formally studied. Um, so, so I think from a mechanism of action point of view, they're pretty interchangeable. Um, the, uh, you know, obviously insurance approval is, is often a barrier. And so it's going to depend very much on the individual's plan. Thank you. So um, anything specific that you kind of recommend for sleep inertia or can we just pause on sleep inertia as this really prevailing um, yeah. and limiting yeah. effect of IH on a person? What would you recommend for people that are really struggling with that? Right. So sleep inertia, of course, is this difficulty waking in the morning where somebody with IH, you know, they're aiming to get up at eight o'clock, they set an alarm or they set multiple alarms and they just can't shake off the sleepiness and they repeatedly fall back asleep. And even when they do get up, they still feel really, really sleepy and kind of confused and not thinking clearly for, you know, an hour or even two hours in the morning. And so I would say that sleep inertia has been one of the most challenging things to manage. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is that you know, with the other meds that I just listed, you know, you take them during the day, but if somebody is so tired in the morning, sometimes it's even a challenge taking the first meds. And so, um, you know, I certainly have plenty of patients where, um, you know, a parent or a, or a partner actually comes in and says, okay, here, take your first pill. And then the patient goes back to sleep and actually then gets up an hour later. And so with the, some of the short acting stimulants that I've, that I've listed here, um, that's, that's an okay thing. If you got to get up at eight, you know, maybe the partner comes in and gives you some Ritalin at seven, and that can help kind of get you a little jump start to make it easier to get up in the morning. Um, one that I wanted to point out, which has not been studied formally, but I just heard some docs talking about this, is this Jornet PM, which is a delayed release stimulant. And so you take it at bedtime, but it doesn't even get into your bloodstream until about six or eight hours later. And so the neat thing with that is that for somebody who is not, where it's not easy to take a pill, before getting up out of bed, they can take the journey at bedtime and then the drug starts to get released around the time that they actually need to get up. Um, so I, I personally don't have any experience with it yet, but it strikes me as a potentially useful um, yeah. way to go. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, the other meds listed there, the modafinil, armodafinil, sorriampatol, patolosan, it's all kind of the same thing as I had on the prior slide. Um, the, 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 Thing with all of those medicines that I would say is that they take a little while to kick in. So you could take them first thing in the morning and maybe it would help. Um, I have seen an occasional patient who takes modafinil at bedtime with the idea being that again, that stimulant effect carries over into the morning and can make it easier to rouse. And so for some folks that that is helpful. But um, uh, you know, I think that I think the, the behavioral option of just having a helper or, or, or if the patient's with it enough to set an alarm earlier than needed and take the meds before they actually need to get out of bed, that's sometimes useful. Yeah. I think we yeah. actually have seen some of the best improvements in sleep inertia with the oxabates. In the, in the phase three trials that were done with Zywave, um, there was really very clear improvements in morning sleep inertia. And it's possible that the way this works is that with the oxabates, they produce this super deep sleep, but then when the drug wears off, you kind of spring awake. And so mm -hmm. it's conceivable that oxabates that when that second dose of Zywave wears off, people actually feel more alert than they might otherwise. And that little boost um, can maybe help get them up and out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the issue with the oxabates, as I said before, is you know solid amount of side effects and, and pretty expensive. And access, yeah, it's an ongoing challenge. So. There's there's a list there, um, so some options for patient, but um, I think people would love to know more. What's what's in the pipeline? What what can uh, our community expect in the next few yeah. years in terms of treatment options? Yeah, well, I think you know from the way our conversation's gone, it's pretty clear there's some serious unmet needs still, right? Um, the, a lot of these meds, yeah, they improve alertness during the day, but people hardly feel normal. Um, and the whole issue of getting up in the morning is a major headache still. And I would say that's something that we really need to improve on. And so um, fortunately, um, there's actually a lot more action in the IH space in terms of drug development than there has been at any time in the past. Um, I think some of the pharma companies have really come to realize that there's a lot of patients out there that are really eager for better medicines. And so it's nice to see there's a 
a whole bunch of stuff under development. Seriously, like 10 years ago, I don't think I could have listed a single drug. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's mm -hmm. nice that there's several things in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. One is something that some of the listeners might have heard of before, clarithromycin. This has been studied um, by the Emory University group for several years, and they continue to do work sort of moving this ahead. It's um, There's a theory that some of the sleepiness of, of IH is due to excessive signaling through the GABA-A receptor. And so this is a drug that blocks that receptor. And so that, um, there's some phase two um, work going on in that. And just, just to remind folks, when, if, when somebody first considers a drug for treating any disease, you do phase one studies to see if it works at all. You do somewhat bigger phase two studies with maybe, you know, 30 people to see, does it, does it work enough? And then finally you do the phase three studies where you do a large number, you know, 100 or 300 patients to really get a good, strong, statistically convincing case that the drug is beneficial. So the clarithromycin is in phase two. Um, remember how we had talked about um, the delayed release uh, Jornet on the previous mm -hmm. slide? There's another yeah. similar medicine, this surdexmethylphenidate. So that's sort of a delayed release version of Ritalin. Um, mm -hmm. And it's made it's under development by this company called Zebra Therapeutics. That's in phase two. Um, the company that makes Pitolisant, it's, it's nice to see they're doing a real proper phase three study of their drug in people with idiopathic hypersomnia. That's underway now. Um, I, I don't, I've heard talk that Lumrise, the once nightly oxabate, is going to be studied in IH. I don't, I honestly don't know quite where that's at and if they've started yet, right. but it's a very natural thing to do. Right especially since many people with IH have a hard time waking up from sleep. And so, you know, one of the problems with the, with the Xyrem and the Zywave is they have to be given twice a night. And if you have trouble getting up, um, it may be hard to take that second dose. And so this has, has a real sort of important angle for that. Um, and then the one I want to talk about in a little bit more depth is these orexin receptor two agonists. Um, there's, there's, um, uh, a, a drug called TAC-861 that's under development by Takeda, um, where I think that they might start recruiting for phase two uh, next year. But um, you might ask, well, wait a minute, orexin, orexin is really a problem in narcolepsy. What's that got to do with idiopathic hypersomnia? And so, you know, in type one narcolepsy, people have very low orexin levels and giving them an orexin agonist makes a lot of sense. People with idiopathic hypersomnia have normal orexin levels. And so it's not like they have a deficiency that we're trying to fix. But having said that, orexin is still a very powerful wake promoting mechanism. And so I just want to show this one slide. Yeah. Um, this is from, remember, um, phase one is that really beginning stage where you're just trying to convince yourself that this is a good path to go down. And so these are results from a, what's called a phase 1B study of this medicine called Danavarexton. And this is an intravenous orexin ag an ag orexin receptor 2 agonist. And so it's not sort of necessarily practical, but it's a good proof of principle. And so what they do in this study is you give the drug intravenously across the day, and they studied 12 people with idiopathic hypersomnia, and they're doing what's called the maintenance of wakefulness test. And so um, this is a test where you ask people to sit in a comfy chair for 40 minutes, doing nothing in a dimly lit room and don't fall asleep. Wow. And um, it's super boring and it's really kind of painful. And you have to do that four times across the day, four 40 minute sessions. And so what you can see here in the green is people who got an, a, an infusion of just of some placebo and they fall asleep in about 10 minutes at two hours after the dosing started, four hours, six hours and eight hours. So those are the four testing intervals. But people who got the Danavarexton basically stayed awake for the entire 40 minutes. And so on the right, you can see the average across those four test sessions and the results are just incredible. Now, yeah. it's this this dose is, is a pretty high dose. Um, and so it shows that this drug is capable of waking people up. But, you know, there was some side effects like frequent urination, dizziness and runny nose. And, you know, obviously you got to figure out a proper dose that is well tolerated and, and effective. And I think I should also emphasize, this is only in 12 people, so we don't want to make too much out of this, yeah. but just the magnitude of effect, I think, is, is pretty encouraging. 
but also just to be clear it wouldn't be a drug ultimately that's administered iv correct correct yeah this is a <laughs> proof of this is a crazy. proof this is a proof of principle right and so this is this this is just showing that an orexin agonist can work and then on the previous side here this one the, the tac 861 that's a that's an oral pill and so um, oh okay yeah and so and so that's 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 the one that would be of much more practical usefulness for for uh, people to take on a day by day basis same same so idea yeah, so that's really early days then for for that medication, super early. And with, yeah. you know, we know that you've explained the three phases, presumably after phase three, it then goes to FDA for approval. So that's a process as well. Yeah. So um, obviously these timelines are, are quite long, you know, years really. Right, right. So, you know, for some of these, like the, um, the patolisant, and the, so that's the Wakex and the once nightly oxidate the loom rise because those are already FDA approved for other things for narcolepsy. One could imagine that if you can convince the FDA that these are effective, you, it could it could be a faster turnaround. But something like the orexin agonists are are several years away still yeah. from 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 regular clinical use. But in the meantime, you know, I would encourage people with IH, you know, if you're near a place that's recruiting for some of these studies, you know, please sign up. That's the only way these drugs really move ahead so they can actually be used. Yes, great. So and also for people listening or watching, we do have um, a page on our website, the Hypersomnia Foundation that lists clinical trials and it goes to clinicaltrial.gov as well. So there's usually a good handful of um, current active trials going on and also of course reach out to us because we do like to give that information you know sitting right there between uh, industry who wants to do the clinical trials and also the patient community so that's really helpful um so the outlook is fairly hopeful dr scammell would you say for people with ih or is that and i don't want to oversimplify things or make it yeah sound quicker than it is but yeah i think that things are looking substantially better than they have been. I think the fundamental problem is something that, you know, these are treatments, but the thing is, we're never going to be able to really make people feel good until we figure out what IH is. And that's a whole different, that's a whole different conversation. Um, because, you know, this is the huge thing with narcolepsy type one, right? When you really understand what is causing the disease, you can make targeted therapies. And my hope is that you know, sometime in the near future, we'll actually really figure out what IH is. Um, and maybe it's going to turn out to be multiple things. You know, maybe some people with IH have sleepiness of one cause, other folks have another cause. But understanding that will really allow us to make much more targeted therapies. Do you think there's an, enough research being done on that aspect then? Or is it just historically there's not been enough attention and now, you know, there's, there is more, but it's sort of years behind. It always sounds like IH sort of from a research perspective is behind narcolepsy and it must be really frustrating for people. Yeah, it's really frustrating. And I think, you know, part of the problem is it's a pretty rare disease. There's not a lot of people who have it. And and so I think, um, and and truth is, there's not a lot of doctors who really understand it. Um, and and so um, I think there is has been an uptick in the number and the amount of clinical research really drilling in and trying to figure out IH. And so that's good. Um, but um, we we definitely need more research on on understanding the disease itself. You know what are the various causes and are there subtypes and so forth. Um, so anyway, yeah, the, the, it's it's getting better, and my hope is that we'll have more and more docs coming into this space, really wanting to research it in a really deep way. Mm -hmm. And of course, for that you need funding, right? It's always yes, that's usually where yes. our, our conversations fall, isn't it? <laughs> right. And and I and of course I'm very happy that the Hypersomnia Foundation is quite interested in pushing that agenda ahead. Indeed. Yeah, trying. I think there's a lot of work to be done there, but um, certainly that's a commitment of ours has been for for some years, probably close to a decade. But there's it's a huge hole. And um, we're really grateful to you, Dr. Scammell, for being so focused on it and for our patient community because it, it does give us hope and it helps us to understand exactly um, the mechanisms, of course, of these medications and what people can look forward to. So thank you ever so much for joining us today. Great talking to you.